My name is Scott. I work at HubSpot San Diego. Woo. What that means is my living room in San Diego. Uh, we, don't, we actually don't have an office, but I do work remote, and I'm constantly like in and out of Pacific Beach. That's where I live, downtown. Just hung out with 41 Orange uh, last week. Uh, yeah, so if anyone ever wants to get a hold of me, questions about HubSpot, marketing, growth marketing, anything like that, happy to hang out. Um, right now, I'm working on freemium user acquisition, and pretty much what that means is when you go from a stranger to actually using our free products, that's the main thing I'm working on now. What all of this presentation is, this is a former life at HubSpot. This is when I was doing uh, free to pay nurturing, a lot of what John talked about on our sales products. So a lot of this is kind of like copywriting, mixed with psychology, mixed with uh, more foundational things. So this right here, uh, this is kind of recycled, some of this from inbound. And I met with legal and I'm like, hey, what data can I actually share? I'm not really sure. Uh, and this is actually the revenue growth that we had during this time period. So again, former life, back in the day, 2015 to 2017, we had the sales product. It used to be called Sidekick. It's now called HubSpot Sales. And this is really what we worked on. And so when I got a hold of legal, they said, okay, you can say triple digit increase. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. I guess I'm not going to actually show the data. Um, and in general, this is kind of when when we really started messing around with automation and copywriting. This is when it really did take off. Note, uh, all this stuff I'm going to show you, copywriting is not like the magic bullet. Uh, there's there's definitely many other pieces that went into it. We have an amazing product team, amazing engineers, amazing PMs. Uh, so this is just kind of one piece of the puzzle. Okay. So I have five uh, frameworks about copywriting in general and kind of psychology. So the first one is the Pareto Law of Copywriting. Anyone know who Joseph Pareto is? Yeah. He's an Italian philosopher. You got it! Nice! He was, there we go. He was an Italian philosopher. Uh, the, the story goes, and for many people have heard this, uh, he had a farm in him on his, his pea pods, he noticed that 80% of his pea pods, or 20% of his pea pods, yielded 80% of his peas. He also noticed that 20% of the population of Italy had 80% of the land. John mentioned this earlier. And what ended up becoming known as the Pareto Law, or the 80-20 rule. And that just means 80% of output comes from 20% input. Anyone who follows Tim Ferriss? Yeah, yeah, okay, a couple people. Nice, yeah. Uh, he talks about this all the time. So we took this framework of the credit law and the 80 20 rule, and we just kind of asked ourselves, like, okay, with copywriting and marketing, how can we actually apply this to what we're doing on the sales product? Mind you, again, back in 2015, 2016. So, when we were doing this, when we were doing the free to pay, uh, a lot of people would kind of ask, like, hey, what's, what have you guys figured out and what have you got to work? And really wanted to see a bunch of tactics and email examples and uh, experiment results and all this. But to be honest, the 80-20 for us really came down to this, this little flywheel right here. And it's mind-blowingly simple, but it's really hard to consistently do it over time. And really what that means is you start off with just listening to your audience and doing a ton of user interviews, backing a lot of it up with like quantitative data and understanding what do they really, really want? And why do they take the actions that they take? Then write down their words, and then third, actually test them in your marketing. So this is what we did again back in 2016, 2015 on actually building our personas, which we now have internally at HubSpot. Uh, we named them Sales Leader Larry and Account Rep Alex, were the names for them. Uh, and, yeah, nice. Classic. Uh, and so this is actually the word for word overview that we have, and then we would run a bunch of data and back it up. 
So once we actually listened to the audience, interviewed them, got the data, then we'd actually write down the words. And how we structured it, I learned this from a, a former VP of marketing at HubSpot, his name's Brian Belfort, and he really helped kind of instill this concept in this flywheel, like constantly listen to your audience, understand how they function, um, write down their words, all that, all that good stuff. And what we came up with is dreams, pains, and barriers. And really what that means is, I can't go back. Can you go back? <laughs> um, yeah, so a dream is like, I wish I could just, or it's so frustrating when I cannot blank. And barrier is more or less an anxiety of, I really want to be able to use your software, but blank. And so it's kind of the blank. And so what we did is divide it up after this probably 50 interviews that we did over the course of time and chunked it down into actual sub hopes and dreams, pains and fears, and then barriers and uncertainties. Then we actually go out and test. One of the things that we heard consistently over time interviewing salespeople is they said, you know what, I really want to spend less time working and more time making money. Duh, like, who doesn't want to do that? Uh, but for whatever reason with that group of people, we heard it over and over and over. And so we're like, all right, let's actually try this on our copy. And so we put this on the homepage. This is one of many variations that we've gone through. I think the one today says, why try a CRM when this one is free? Uh, so we're always iterating, always testing on the website, but this is what ended up working really, really well. And so that did yield like 100% increase. It was wild. Uh, so again, that this is one of five uh, of like copywriting frameworks that we've actually followed. It seems really, really simple, but it's hard to implement. So, okay, we'll, we'll take a little poll. So in the last month, how many of you have done uh, like a formal customer interview? Not a sales call. One, two, three, four, six. Anyone else? Okay, that's like six out of 40 people uh, in the last 30 days. And my hand's actually not even raised. I, I'm, I'm talking about it and trying to preach it, but it's really, really hard to actually do. I have not talked to a customer in the last 30 days either. But it's so important to actually get into their head and constantly understand, like, what are you thinking? Why are you thinking that? Uh, whether you have a software product or you're an agency, it's kind of running through this exercise. Uh, okay, number two. Uh, we're we're going to go back to site class a little bit. So this is called the Zygrid Impact. Uh, are, we're going to take another poll again. This is how much money an industry made last year. And these are the options. It's $630 billion. So number one is TV and movie. Number two is the live events industry. And number three is the software industry. So by show of hands, who thinks it's number one? Zero? All right, who thinks it's number two? Uh, okay, like five, eight people. Who thinks it's number three? Everyone is wrong. Not one single person is right right now. <laughs> this is actually the entertainment industry. Uh, the entertainment industry, Warner Brothers, Netflix, Hulu, everything. $630 billion were made in this industry. There's really two core reasons at the foundation why this is so profitable. Uh, number one is storytelling. It's kind of evolved and that's how we've grown over time. And number two, I would argue, is this notion of this argument effect, and which is actually just an input of storytelling. And basically what that means is it's psychologically uncomfortable to, let, to not finish something once we actually start it. Example, uh, you're at the end of Breaking Bad. He just like broke into something and now he's found a new lab and starts cooking meth. And at, at the very end of it, oh God, it's like 10.30 at night. I just want to keep watching the next episode. I'm just going to do it. Game of Thrones, Breaking Bad, 
uh, any show you can think of. They all do the same thing, and that's what keeps you hooked to the show. You see it in the news, on the radio, on podcasts, on serial, everything. They're always like coming up next, and they leave this thing that's called opening the loop, and then it makes you continue to watch it. And the more you watch it, the more you engage with it, the more views you have, the more uh, media producers can sell that to media buyers, and the more revenue that's made, which ties back into $630 billion. And then finally, the same thing happens on Sports Center. It's kind of why I like this little bar is up there, because you want to see what's coming up next, and you stick around, and you're like, oh, okay, I actually want to see what happens with absent Americans, whatever that means. <laughs> I don't know. So again, Zagreb, the fact it's really uncomfortable to not finish something once you start it. When I first met John, uh, one, he has a really funny story about his first week in San Francisco. If anyone finds him afterwards, just ask him about it. Two, he told me about Trump Club. In the Trump Club, how they actually made you go through all of the steps. What's your waist size? What's your paneling? What's your shirt size? And once you got to the very, very end, then you would create an account. Duolingo, anyone use Duolingo? Cool. This is how Duolingo used to have their sign up flow. And what this was is you download the app from the app store, you enter your email, and you create a password. Standard. That's what a lot of people do. Then they ran a test, and they thought, okay, what happens if we don't have that barrier? Step one, I had get started. Step two, I pick the language that I want to learn. Step three, I pick the goal, how often do I actually want to dedicate time to this? And then I can actually start learning the language. Once you make it all the way in and you try to exit the app, you have to create a profile. Once you get started with something, it's really hard to not keep going. And you don't want to lose the progress that you actually made. When Duolingo ran this, I don't have the uh, article. If anyone asks, you can send it out. It's so good. It's like one of the best articles I've read in a while. Uh, they lifted their daily active users by 20% just by running this test. And this is something that today we're actually considering doing on the user acquisition front. Uh, okay, so. Back at that time, how could we actually apply this to HubSpot sales? Uh, we sent an email where we just kind of told the story. And the story was about Warren Buffett and his pilot. His private pilot, it's no surprise he's a private pilot. So Warren Buffett's private pilot, he looks at Warren, and he's like, you know what, I've, just kind of, I've been thinking a lot more about my life and what I really want to get out of life and all the things I want to accomplish. And I'm kind of having like a weird existential crisis. And Warren Buffett looks at his pilot and he's like, okay, I'm Warren Buffett. I can, uh, I can coach you through this, no problem. Uh, so what Warren Buffett said was write down 25 things you actually want to accomplish in your life. This pilot said, all right, I can do that. Sounds good. Goes home. They go their separate ways. He writes down 25 things. Comes back to Warren Buffett. Here's my list, 25 things, I'll let. Warren Buffett says, all right, now I want you to circle the five things that matter most, put that on a different list, and keep your old list. So you would have 20 things and then five. Okay, I guess I can do that. That's a lot to actually go through. Warren Buffett sees him for the third time, and he says, all right, do you have the two lists? Pilot says, yes. Warren Buffett asked him, all right, what do you do with those two lists? And the pilot said, I guess I would just work on the five things that I want to accomplish most in my life before I die. And after that, I'll try to get to the remainder of the 20. Let's go. And Warren Buffett said, no. That is not correct. And for me, what Warren Buffett ended up saying completely changed how I approach work, how I approach life, how I approach so many things. 
Does anyone want to know what he said? Jonathanism. So I'll tell you what he said in a second. But we basically sent an email out. This is back for content. This is unrelated to actual revenue. But we sent the, a blog post out. This really back in the day. Uh, where we told that story and we didn't really give away the ending. And then in the second variation, we actually gave away the ending. The ending was, okay, you, you have the five things. Take the list of 20 and throw it away. Hide it, burn it, do whatever you want, get it out of here, never look at it, at it again. And that actually is something that I constantly uh, muscle that trying to flex. Anyway, that like more than 2 x the engagement on the email. And that's just one example. We're like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. This is the most powerful uh, A-B test we ever ran, picking a certain uh, concept. And that concept was the Zygernik effect. But leave someone guessing, kind of leave the loop open and seeing how they engage. Consistently, over time, there's about that one. Exactly. Yeah. And by the way, any questions? Whatever. Okay, so challenge number two of five is actually just try it. The next, uh, is anyone consistently creating blog posts? Do you send emails out of those blog posts? Okay, try it. Just see what happens. Uh, give away the ending. If it's not a story, make it a story. Uh, storytelling is really works and it helps with All righty, number three, FOMO. So, FOMO. Uh, Royce, what's the definition of FOMO? Fear of missing out. There you go. Fear of missing out. So let's, uh, go, going back to psychology class again, uh, diagnose fear a little bit. This is our brain. Our brain is divided into really three sections. One is uh, the Lane serves as the reptilian brain. The second is the mammalian brain. Aaron Stock patches. It's beautiful now. <laughs> and then fifth is the human brain. So how does this actually relate to business? Well, when you tie that together with Maslow's hierarchy of needs and you look at the different progression, how the brain has progressed over time, we have physiological needs and safety needs. Physiological needs is I need to go to sleep, uh, I need to eat, I need to drink water, I need to use the bathroom. Safety is if you break into my house, I'm going to be afraid for my life and I'll do whatever I can to protect myself and the person I'm with who I love. I don't want to lose my car. I don't want to lose my house. You know, it's like the protection of those people around you and the things that you want. The million, which is that second part of the brain, also has those two, but then in addition to love and belonging. If you come home and you see that, you can't help but just be like, oh my god, I love this. <laughs> it's my puppy voice. Uh, okay, and then the final two is self esteem and self actualization. Self esteem is pretty much ego, more or less. Uh, do the people around you respect me? Do I respect myself? Uh, and then self-actualization is, can I really, am I really being all that I can be in life? The difference uh, with that graph is like, this isn't necessarily a question a lizard would be asking himself. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, going back to this, how does this actually tie into marketing and tie into branding? Well, the really interesting part is if you take the time and you think about it, so many companies actually attack, especially B2C, attach themselves to a specific need. Charmin is a great example of a physiological need. Uh, we have it, Procter & Gamble is one of the best, um, has one of the best like marketing teams in the country, and I think Charmin's a brand of that, I'm not sure. Uh, safety is, Allstate is a great example, any insurance company is a great example of that. You don't want to lose your car. You don't want to lose your house. Uh, everything along those lines. Love and belonging. Facebook. Also self-esteem. 
What's that? It's also self-esteem. I agree with that. It's definitely self-esteem. Facebook, you don't... It, it, it kind of makes up for any lack of in-person social connection that you may have. Or, for me, my family lives uh, in the Midwest. No one's in California. And so it kind of makes me closer to my family, constantly seeing pictures of my niece, um, my parents, my sisters, and so on. Rolex, any luxury product. Uh, Jaguar, Rolex, um, nicer clothes. A lot of it has to do with status. And am I being perceived the way that I want to be perceived? And then self-actualization, I would say, is like 10. A lot of educational companies are learning everything that I can about being well that I can be. Okay, FOMA, HubSpot. What does any of this have to do with HubSpot? So we'll get to that in a second. First, kind of here's an example out in the wild of a campaign that's really going after a certain emotion, and Allstate does it in a really funny way. Uh, all, the, all these commercials are really funny, but no one protects you dollar for dollar like me. Same thing. Guy is running out, fireball hits his car, he runs out, and, he, and he's shocked, and, you know, and your TV show goes on. Uh, <laughs> and then also with this whole framework to kind of have like a trigger action reward for habit building, with Allstate, it's kind of the fear of loss. I really don't want to lose my car. I really don't want to lose my house. And so you purchase that, and then you kind of have uh, like peace of mind. It's in ads all the time. This is anyone who anyone take a marketing class like in college. Yeah, ethics and marketing. This kind of stuff comes up all the time. Um, Fear-based marketing. This is an example of a soap company. This is an example of a nonprofit. And this is in publishing all the time and in content marketing, inbound marketing, where you go after the mistake to avoid and not the thing to do better. So this is from USA Today. Don't be that mom when you take your kids back to school. No one wants to be that mom. Uh, here are the mistakes you want to avoid this year. So point being, FOMO, fear, this can kind of be used as a scalpel or a knife. It can be used for good, it can be used for bad, but it's the reality. Uh, fear is kind of how we've evolved over time. It's for our own survival, and then that plays into evolution. Royce, fear of missing out. This is kind of bringing it back to it. And so the whole point of that is to understand that fear is the most deeply rooted thing in our evolution as human beings, and this is why FOMO tends to work more or less. Uh, anyone heard of loss aversion? Read Thinking Fast and Slow? So he ran an experiment where he gave $50 to person A, and then he gave $100 to person B, and then he measured their happiness. Who thinks person A was more happy than person B? Uh, this person was more happy than that person. No, no difference uh, at all. The really interesting part is that when he actually took away $50, they netted the same amount of money, but the person on uh, scenario number two, they were significantly less happy because you actually lost what you once had. And so we're always trying to protect the things and not lose what? So this is an example from Booking.com. <laughs> it's almost hilarious how over the top they are. Someone just booked this room in high demand. You just missed it. Sold for 148. You missed it. Sold for 100. Three people are looking now. Jackpot. This is the last one on the site. Last chance. High demand. Only one room left on the site. It's so over the top. But it's everywhere. It's on Airbnb. Only 5% of listings are left. These things exist for a reason because it makes you take an action because you don't want to miss out on that shiny new thing, that hotel, anything. Anyone who goes up to Big Bear regularly or I've been to their website, they do a remarketing ad that looks like this. 
and three season passes, two mountains, one screaming deal. Hurry, prices go up December 6th. Every time you see prices go up blank, it's there for a reason. Same thing with countdown timer. When you're doing like the checkout on Ticketmaster or whatever, uh, it's, it's kind of like forces you to actually make that purchase. So, FOMO, HubSpot, we asked Michelle, like, how can we actually implement this? Again, this is way back in the day. John brought up our messages product that we have. This is when it was in beta in early 2016, I believe, about uh, two years ago. Uh, and this is like when I was working on this product. And so we sent out this email saying, hey, we, uh, we have this new tool coming out. It's called HubSpot Messages. It's really awesome. And we're like, all right, let's, let's actually test this email and try to see if we can get FOMO to work because we, it's actually natural in this case. We had the beta product. We could only have 50 people come in because it was brand new. We we're going to have a bunch of bugs. Um, and we just, we could only have a certain amount of people come in. So we sent version A, which uh, was basically like this. And then version B, sorry, I got, kind of got cut out. It said, PS, messages is in private beta, so we're only accepting the first 50 people. If you book after all 50 spots are taken, you'll have to wait until it's out of private beta. We really didn't think it would make a huge difference. It made a really big difference. Uh, we ran this email consistently because we would put them out in batches where we could only take 50 people, work through the bugs, take another 50, work through the bugs, take another 50, work through the bugs. And over time, when we tested this variation against the other, that was like 996 sales meetings. And I can't show you the full funnel, but I can show you like a rough idea on kind of what that netted. And that was about 40K. And sales just from this one email by using this variation. We had a really, really complex product, again, back in 2016, where we would analyze all the emails, all what we call PQLs, that's what we still call them today, they're product qualified leads, so when you're in the product, you take a certain action, the sales rep will get notified. We look at what's the volume, uh, what's the close rate, how much money total is being made, what's the average sales price, how many close one deals, and then we cut it up for product, we put it in a pivot table, we actually go out and analyze all this stuff. But all of it kind of came back to running these experiments that were rooted in psychological frameworks such as Zygrenic Defect or FOMO. So challenge number three, try FOMO. Try, like, just try adding like, an offer and just seeing what happens. Um, okay, I think John might have touched on this. Uh, Back in, during this time, uh, we were working on something that ended up now being known as the Auto Prospector, and it's used all over HubSpot. We, it was more or less just a side project and an experiment when we had a sales team that were off in a quarter of about 15 people with myself, another marketer, and one of the smartest people I've ever met, his name's Mike Peachy. He's a sales director at HubSpot. And it was me, another marketer named Sam Wiesek, and myself, and we were kind of just like playing around and trying to get this thing to work. And through a bunch of iterations, a bunch of uh, tests, we eventually got it to click. And that was just getting it to the point of being usable and scalable. And then John came in and took it from like here to like there. Uh, so, through, <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of. Uh, interesting things that we learned during the early phase of this. What sparked this? We have 15, 15 salespeople on this team. This is about what their time looked like, roughly. About 40% of the time was prospecting, another 40% actually talking to people, and about 20% doing habit work. So the goal was, okay, let me actually do this, and what was this thing anyway? And how can you guys actually implement it? Uh, again, I do live in San Diego. I'm more than happy to walk people through the technical side of this. Any HubSpot users or non-HubSpot users, I can try to help you figure it out too. I'm not gonna go through it. 
far too complex for this presentation, but I'm just going to show you the high level. Um, so th there's like pretty much four macro steps. Uh, first, you kind of need someone in sales who really knows the sales funnel, the sales pipeline. Uh, you need someone who's pretty technical. Uh, that was Sam. And then someone who really thinks about copywriting and writing in general, and that was me. Uh, so how it works basically is that the marketer will write emails on behalf of the sales reps. This happens uh, quite a bit today. Um, so this is kind of a newer experiment back in the day. So we would write the email and then it would dynamically change based on the territory that someone was in. So for example, on the back end of HubSpot, um, how many people are HubSpot users? So a little more than half, 60, 70%. You can probably make this work in with like stitching other tools together, like Zapier or something. Um, but this is all obviously used in HubSpot. We would use contact tokens, and uh, that would dynamically change based on the territory that the person was in. If you live in San Diego, you would get an email from Rob. If you live in Boston, you would get an email from Emily. It was all the exact same content, but we changed it up by giving a different uh, signature and then a different calendar link. And it was all dynamic. You could send one email, everything changed automatically. What that ended up doing was like really, really doubling down on sales productivity. And with this small team, it dropped it down drastically. Today, it's a little higher because we went from a small team to 15% or 50 people up to the sales team, I think it's like four or 500 people today at HubSpot. So that prospecting number definitely went back up. But it's really powerful if you can just use automation to kind of send the same email, but dynamically change it up. Uh, I'll just show some examples of like emails that were forwarded. So I just want to give you a shout out for writing an awesome email and converting my team. Uh, this, this is kind of more a more common response. Uh, we got really weird. I got really weird with some of the emails that we would end up saying, sending. Uh, one of them is like, I like how engaging your emails were, and if I were in a position, we're moving forward, we definitely do it. Don't stop sending emails. I get great ideas on how to be more human. So being more human is definitely the, the kind of the last closing bit in the next section. Okay, so again, uh, my Twitter handle is SJ Towsley. If you want to actually do this, if you are a HubSpot customer, I'm happy to come meet you at a coffee shop, your office, whatever. And I can show you what it looks like for us. Uh, basically, you just need the email software, scheduling software, and CRM software to make it all work. Uh, any questions so far for me? Twitter handle, one more time. SJ T O U S L E Y. Okay, last one. Two more kind of psychological frameworks called the liking principle and the isolation effect. Has anyone seen this app? Yeah, okay. It's hilarious. This app, this was Snoop Dogg. He's uh, in, in an E24 app. Basically, what, why all those ads are actually ran is rooted in this concept that we are a lot more influenced to actually make a purchase and engage with someone if we like them, and we're often more likely to like someone if we make them laugh. Works a lot in B2C. It can definitely be a fine line with B2B as I learned through many mistakes. There's really two different buckets of persuasion how it works, you kind of have a central route to persuasion and then a peripheral route to persuasion. Really what that means is the peripheral route is a very emotional decision. It tends to happen for commodity products like deodorant. I mean, it's deodorant. Uh, you'll, you probably have like brand loyalty at this time, but when you're first making that decision, you went through one way or another, likely through some type of emotion. You didn't necessarily sit down and analyze the chemicals that are in each deodorant and uh, make like a logical decision. If you're buying a car, 
tend to, yes, there is the emotional aspect of that in the branding, but you tend to make a much more logical decision. How many miles per gallon? Um, how many miles does it have? Where is it from? The interesting thing is all of this is rooted in that liking principle and that we're, ten, we're a lot more likely to do business with someone if we like it. We're a lot more likely to go and buy this deodorant because we saw this commercial and in the end you're kind of making like a decision based on emotion. Uh, here's a couple other examples of companies that are doing this really well. Uh, E24 has great emails that they send out. There's a sock company called Foot Cardigan. They do a great job as well. And then Chick-fil-A is kind of a classic campaign that they run. Because again, it's fast food. A lot of options. The last psychological like framework is called the, the isolation effect. So if I could get you uh, to go back on the slide after this. Um, yeah, go forward and then Okay, so I'm going to click and then go back. So, nope, we're going to get this, nope. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, I don't know what it's doing. <laughs> it's all right. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go forward and then go back. So it's just a test. I'm going to flash something on the screen, and so pay attention, and it's only going to last for a split second, and then just, uh, I'm going to pick, and just shout out the, the first thing that you remember. Okay, ready? Nope. 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 We're going to get this. I don't know what's going on. I don't either. I'm not pressing anything. Okay. Okay. It's not going to be chicken. It's a good guess, though. Okay. You can answer I got it. Okay, ready? Go. Go back. All right, what do you remember? Why do you remember the gray dot? What? Oh, no. wow. Very detailed. Very, very detailed. Nice. Uh, yeah, you can go back to that slide. I think my quicker stuff. The purple dot? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's the whole concept. That's the whole concept nice, uh, of the liking principle is like, we remember the things that stick out and that are a little bit different. And that was really rooted in all the successful and very unsuccessful emails that we would send out is really just trying to be different and be memorable and stick out in people's minds as someone that they kind of like. Oh, it was working. Um, anyone read this book by Seth Godin? Yeah. My opinion, best book ever written on marketing. Uh, it's basically that concept that we tend to remember things that are different and things that actually stick out. Okay. Five out of five. Last lesson. How do we actually apply this to HubSpot sales? This was really the main thing that we would try over and over and over. And some would work and some would fail. And some would work and some would fail. Uh, we would try sending. So this was an email we actually sent out back when Steph Curry was really, really popular. And so we had a meetings product. And we had some joke in there like, oh, start booking. What does it say? You're winning more deals than Steph Curry is winning basketball games. Uh, and so that, had a, that booked a ton of meetings. And then we had something like, okay, you know those horrible infomercials where the, uh, the narrator's like, but wait, there's more. And then you have to wait, and then you end up getting like two magical sponges instead of just one. Uh, <laughs> like we would send emails like this. And so it was really interesting because we tried to really be different and it did work, but it also is tough because it can go against the branding of what we have pre-existing. So that was something that we really struggled with. Uh, but that did great. We had like 215 sales meetings. We had uh, movie references, Star Wars. Uh, we referenced Kanye West at some point in time. Uh, the weirdest thing that we ever did was take each sales rep and Photoshop their head on an elf and then we wrote a poem that ended up being about the meetings tool. It was like absolutely absurd. Uh, we thought it would 
crush it because a lot of the other ones were doing well. Uh, uh, didn't do well. Uh, <laughs> so, lesson learned. Um, but again, going back to all of this, this is. Um, I was going to say go back, but you can just leave it. It's fine. Um, what ended up happening is all of this stuff is really rooted in that liking principle, being a little bit different, trying to stand up. Uh, all in all, it ended up doing pretty well. And so we kind of get this feedback loop going, um, whether it was from like Mike himself or some other people who were in sales or Darmesh or Brian, like things were going really well because we were just trying to be different. Like we were trying to do different things and it was really risky. And this is the last uh, thing that I would say and I would say it's the most important and it's the hardest to get to work from my experience. Uh, the spectrum of weirdness is what I call it. Uh, so over here, that's the L female. That's some like, kind of like, wait, what? Um, what are you even talking about? E24 is kind of like that. They're really strange, but it's funny if you're in that kind of humor. And then over here is just a really standard, straightforward email. Hello, sir or madam. Uh, I would like to inquire if you'd be interested in purchasing my, you know, like we all get those horrible emails that are really, really straightforward and we archive them immediately. So how do you actually find the balance between those two? I don't have a great answer for you. Uh, we tried some things that worked, we tried some things that didn't work, but thinking about the liking principle, it really just comes back to, to striking a balance. So I kind of closed out, this is a really cheesy quote, but uh, yeah, I really I genuinely believe in it for like a professional sense. It's if we're doing everything like everyone else, we're just going to be another great dot. If we can learn to be a little different, and try some different things, some may work really bad and some may not. Um, in general, like the biggest risk is just doing what everyone else is doing. And just to kind of close it out, if anyone's doubtful that if you don't believe we're doing weird stuff like sending elf emails or pictures of Star Wars, uh, this is me when I was growing up as a child. I've been practicing this for a while. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, this, is my, this is my Twitter. And if you want to get in touch, again, I'm local to San Diego, so I'm happy to come and like, show anyone any processes that we've done. Beer? I have one on the beer missing out. Um, how would you implement that or any ideas for more B2B enterprise software? So longer sales cycle, like if you're missing out, I mean, we have a six month sales cycle, then I can really miss out. Like, you yeah. Can't, you can't even get it. It's new like, new features. Okay. How often, if you're launching new features pretty frequently, um, HubSpot's always launching new features, so it's kind of dependent on the business, but that's where we've got the most bang for our buck is when we're actually launching something, we have to get something in beta, and we can only have a certain amount of people in it because we need to test the waters and make sure it's not gonna drastically break, it puts a bad taste in everyone's mouth. Uh, we just wanna roll it out slowly over time. So new feature development worked pretty well for us. <laughs> so, all right, I literally can't read my own handwriting, but for those- I can't either, that, sorry. <laughs> that's sad. Um, so the one where it's psychologically uncomfortable to finish something that you started. Yeah. So when you leave those cliffhangers on emails, I'm sure that makes your click through rate to go up, go up uh, for that one email, but do you find that you get a diminishing level of return? Because I know that for me, I, I fall for clickbait all the time, yeah. and then I resent it, and then I unsubscribe. Yeah. Um, so you mean like from an email perspective, like unsubscribe? Yeah, from email, and also if you're doing that via social, you know, the, the whole trend yeah. to go with someone into continuing something, yeah. do you find that it's a diminishing level of return after a certain amount of time? So this one, the example that I gave was back on for like content related to blog related. What we used was a tool that was actually local to San Diego called Filament, Digital Telepathy, created it. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so we used that tool and we would actually look at what we really cared about was engagement on the blog post and that meant share rate, scroll depth, and they would wrap all of that into one engagement metric and so we could see 
how is the engagement doing on the blog post? If we were running tests and we were like, oh sweet, click through it went up by 3x. And then everyone just bounces on the blog post because it's not what they expected, or they didn't share it because it wasn't valuable for them. That's a fail for us. Um, so we would look at things that happen down funnel and make sure that the end result is what we want and not necessarily like the first step of what ultimately matters in the end. With unsubscribes, we didn't notice any difference for that specific test. Because again, we would take frameworks like that, run a bunch of different variations, and kind of watch for patterns. But yeah, unsubscribes didn't necessarily go. Yeah. Uh, so they were talking about the pick your own adventure. I think that's that one. So when I create an email, I generally have the image, uh, engaging text link, and a button link. Yeah. Do you have metrics against what are more often clicked? Does the button significantly get more clicks than a body text link will get versus an image? Um, man, I'm trying to think back. I, I do all three options. Like yeah, yeah. I mean, it depends on the email. Like, it's definitely not an absolute. Uh, like, it depends on the context of what's going on. One thing we did notice, this is kind of when I was transitioning personally from doing this nurturing, this free paid stuff, to actually freemium user acquisition. Uh, we started putting videos in there, and videos like Loom videos or Vidyard, and people click on the videos because it's more of a novelty. They're like, wait. Someone's holding a sign with my name on it. That's weird. Uh, and then you actually click that, and that helped with engagement. Uh, with headline versus image versus button versus depends. Uh, it's definitely not a, a one size fits all. Yep. So what that was was mainly, I would say about 80% free users of our free software, or um, the 20% were actually using the full marketing suite product that we have. So your, your goal was also to be like, hey, we have this feature, you should also buy our product. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, which tactic would you say you need the best ROI? Uh, number one, I mean, you can argue that it's not a tactic, but actually listening to what people are saying, putting those words in your marketing, testing it. I can show you email metrics. I can show you psychological tests that we did in frameworks. None of it's going to come close to actually sitting down, interviewing your customers, Listening to what they say and actually putting words in your mar in your marketing um, and running tests like that, like that's it's not sexy. It's not what I would thought would be the case, but it's pretty hard to argue with. So uh, if you want beyond that, uh, I would say that the kind of the hey we can only take these many spots uh, until the end it's going to run out. That's been a pattern that has, has worked pretty well. And also it's true, it's not a lie. I think once you get into like, you try to pretend that, hey, we can only take 30 people, but really you have room for a thousand. You know, that, that comes when you're doing the marketing ethics, but that worked pretty well for us. Yeah? Did you do any uh, research or find the color buttons? Blue, green, orange, is there one that generally stands up more? Is it based on the branding of the email in the first place? Not really. Not, nothing related to color. Um, yeah, and, and it, again, it's completely dependent on every single business. In general, making small little tweaks, it's gonna go from blue to orange, red to green. It's not gonna make it as big a difference as running, like consistently taking some type of framework. So for us, like FOMO or whatever, and running different variations of completely different emails or something drastically different in like the PS or the, the header, or the intro, um, versus just making a small little tweet. Uh, any other questions? All right. Cool. So